Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Uh, I gotta say we're only two weeks away from the eclipse. Everyone's getting all excited. We're all practicing, getting our software lined up. But tonight uh, we have Nico Carver, who has been on before, who's gonna tell us all about building an observatory in his backyard. Uh, something we probably all dreamed about or thought about, but most of us have, you know, it's like, no, no, it's too big a project for us. Uh, but Nico is going to tell us about his experience. Now, I know that he's done a program where I saw just a foundation, so I bet there's more than one story about how this thing went along. But before we get into that, and we have two weeks until the eclipse, I'm getting all excited. I'm sorry. So <laughs> next week, we have Adam, no, who's next week? Adam Block is coming next week. Now I saw Adam had this great image of the comet. What was it, Pons? What's the name of that comet? Some, uh, Pondsbrook. Some in Pondsbrook's comet. Beautiful picture. And he's going to tell us how he put that together. And then the week after, what's the week after this? Two weeks? Oh, yeah, it's the eclipse. eclipse. It's the oh. eclipse. <laughs> I hope all of you out there are going to go to the eclipse one way or another, find your way. You don't have to be any one place. You can just be someplace, just along the path of totality. So after, uh, after Adam, so eclipse, and then after that, Claire is going to come and tell us about what is this from sky to screen not sure what that subject is and after that we have neve and then we're back on but not wasting any more time on what's coming up why nico i don't know what to say about you except if you look at nico's presentations on youtube there are a lot of them he has a lot of traffic some very interesting subjects so i'm expecting something special from you tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Okay, I'm going to start my presentation here. All right, so um, as Eric said, I have a lot of presentations on YouTube, and I've actually made several videos about building this observatory. So it might seem odd that now I'm giving a presentation on uh, this channel about it. But I realized um, uh, right after I finished it that I, I wanted to do sort of like a retrospective because you realize a lot of things sort of after you finish. And all those videos that I made on the channel were more diary style. They were like, as I was building it. Um, so a lot of insights have come to me, at, you know, in the couple of months since I finished it now. Um, and I say finish it, but you can actually see in this picture, it's not quite finished. The the trim work isn't really done, but I'm now waiting for the snow to melt for, for that to happen. We just got dumped on again uh, last night, another couple feet. So we're still, we're, we're still waiting for spring up here in New Hampshire. Um, uh, something a little unique about how I went about this build is, as you can see in the title, is I built it entirely on my own. I didn't have any help in building it. And some might be thinking, you know, why would you do that? Why not get help with something big like this? And I definitely could have enlisted help. So it was a, it was a choice I made. And uh, part of it was that since I was filming the whole thing for YouTube, I find it can be really hard when I have other people around to uh, get the filming done and not be distracted and make mistakes if I'm trying to do something like building and, and filming and doing all these things at the same time. Another reason I wanted to do it all on my own is that um, it's it's really how I learn. I'm, I guess I'm just sort of a loner when it comes to learning stuff. I, I like to take my time and go at my own pace. and. I was worried as soon as I you know, brought in other people, maybe people with more experience, things would go faster and easier, um, but it might be harder for me to absorb what was actually happening. What was, what, was, what was I actually learning in the building process? And so since I was doing this, you know, mostly because I really wanted a backyard observatory, but also because I was doing these educational videos, I think that building it on my own as a novice was the right choice for me so that the videos could really be uh, useful to people who might also be approaching this like I was without any building experience. 
All right, so here are the main topics that I decided I want to cover tonight. Um, and I'll jump right in here. So the first thing I want to talk about is site selection. And when I say site selection, I actually mean two things. I don't, I mean, uh, not just uh, where you put the observatory in your yard. For me, it also meant where, what yard I was going to be putting it in at all, because I actually decided when moving that I wanted a a uh, place where I felt that a backyard observatory would make sense. So in 2021, when I first started seriously thinking about this, about a, this being a real possibility, you know, in the next three to five years, I was living in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is in the Boston metro area. So if you look on this map, you see that big pinkish white spot on the light pollution map there. That's where I was located. So when I wanted to get to darker skies um, as quickly as possible, I would often be driving north into Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine uh, up here. And in this area of you know the northeastern U.S. or New England, as we call it, it's possible to go from a Bortle nine sky, like in Boston, to Bortle three or even Bortle two, with just a two-hour drive. And I think a lot of people don't know that. I think a lot of people, when they hear the Northeast, they sort of write off the whole thing as light pollution hell or something. But you can see from this map that there's actually a fair amount of you know darker skies in uh, these more northern states. Um, and there's actually um, some Bortle 4 dark skies uh, to the south, too, like in Rhode Island. Um, the the problem with going north, of course, is that um, it's it's not like uh, the Midwest where you have a lot of farmland, or out west where you just have a lot of like desert and open thing, open vistas like that. It's it's very forested. So finding places that have dark skies and good horizons is a challenge. And so a lot of people um, have asked me, you know why build an observatory in the Northeast? Because the trees are so much taller, your weather sucks. Why not just go to the desert? Um, and so I considered it, but the simple answer for me is that I'm just not a desert person. I'm not, I'm not a hot weather person in general. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota. I love the winter months. I love snow and cold weather and skiing and all that kind of stuff. So for me, there were a lot of reasons outside of astronomy that I wanted to stay in the north, um, and you know, in terms of uh, of the northern states, I, I don't think New Hampshire, Vermont are, are are much worse than many of your other options. Like if you go out uh, west but stay in the north, it's often really rainy and cloudy out there as well. So I I decided I want to stay in New England, and then I also say that since I was doing this search um, starting in 2021 from Somerville, where I was still working in the Boston area, it, it made sense to look here because finding a uh, property um, that's good for astronomy, uh, it, you, you, I think it's important to actually see these places in person. And so let me, I'll, I'll give you an example for the property that I ended up uh, buying here. So this is the property that I ended up buying marked in uh, the yellow uh, line right here. And this is a rural location. It's Bortle 3. Um, it's at the end of a one mile long dirt road, no street lamps within about 30 miles. Um, but then what I was very impressed by was that this property had inexpensive $50 a month fiber internet service that I'm using right now. And it was just a 30 minute drive to a town that had a movie theater, a grocery store, Home Depot, pretty much anything that I was gonna need. So that combination of a dark sky, fairly close to amenities, good internet, a house that I actually was interested in. I, I sort of liked the idea of living in an old house. This house was built in 1850. Um, and I, so it was a really nice combo. Um, but sometimes when I'd, I'd find that good kind of combo and then I'd look at the satellite image like this and find that it was so forested that, you know, it was not possible for astronomy. I'd have to cut down so many trees. But in this case, the yard looked a little 
big, bigger <laughs> on, the, on the bigger side for New Hampshire. But what really interested me was the tree line back here, um, where I marked with the dotted yellow line, um, because that looked to be a few hundred feet away. That gives me a nice view to the Northwest. And that's important to me because my favorite constellations are uh, Cygnus and Cepheus and Cassiopeia, which all transit to the North. Now, the one thing I was worried about with this location uh, was this house right here, um, because I was worried, you know, if if a neighbor is that close and you know they, they just have a lot of exterior lights, that might not be good. So my plan was when I was going to the open house to try to visit with that neighbor and see if they might be amenable to you know responsible outdoor lighting. Um, but it turns out that that neighbor wasn't there. Uh, that house wasn't there. The the Google map imagery was wrong. That that building had been torn down and the owner of this land behind the house here, um, I was able to talk to and they said they're going to keep that field clear. They're not going to plant any trees, but they're also not going to build any buildings back there. So this worked out great for me. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, but I wouldn't have known any of this uh, unless I'd been in the area and can go to the open house and like figure all this stuff out. So I think it is important when looking for properties for astronomy, if that's sort of the route you're going, to probably be in the area so you can actually visit them. And once I got uh, this far with any of the properties I was looking at, like if I liked it during the day, if I thought it was going to work, I'd ask the real estate agent if I could come back at night. And I always got the okay to do that. Um, and of course, that gives you the real ground truth of how dark a location is, because just looking at the light pollution map, you can you know, you can click on it and it'll tell you uh, an estimated SQM. But I've found that often those are pretty far off from the truth. So I always like to actually measure with my own meter, and I have one of these fancy meters that moves around the whole sky and gives you a, a map of the uh, sky brightness in every direction. So I was doing that at any place that I was interested in. And this one um, registered quite dark. Now, the trees are pretty high, uh, especially to the uh, west, um, but also to the east. To the south and north, it, it's pretty good. Um, where my observatory ended up, I have down to about 25 degrees to the north and down to 35 degrees to the south. The west is basically just completely blocked. It's up to like 60 degrees. And the east is mostly good except for one tall tree. Um, so for New Hampshire, that's actually really not that bad. Um, it's it, it could be worse. So that was the first part of site selection was picking, you know, where I was going to buy this house with a yard. I did that. Um, and as soon as I had the property, this was August 2022, um, I then decided I'd uh, wait several months before actually starting the observatory build. So, um, I so August 22, I wanted to give myself till summer 2023 to actually start building. And the reason I wanted to do this is because my method for picking a site within the property was I wanted to move around a bunch of different spots in the yard and just try out different spots, see what I like about them, see what the sky looked like from different spots in the yard, what it would feel like in relation to, you know, the house and the neighbors and different things, um, and that that worked really well. I kept records and uh, where I was, you know, finding that I liked setting up. And the other thing that was happening right around this time is that I found during this year of experimentation with this darker location that I was getting more and more drawn to dusty objects like these, um, like like. Uh, reflection nebulae and, and dark nebulae um, and shooting them in LRGB uh, because before this I was more of like a narrowband shooter so that's what I had really uh, gotten you know into initially because I lived in cities I had less time to spend at dark sites um, so this did factor into my decision of like where to set up the observatory as well because if you're thinking about where do these dusty objects primarily uh, exist in the sky? They're in these molecular clouds in Cepheus and Taurus. And so wherever I set up the observatory, 
I wanted to make sure that um, I could get the most out of those constellations throughout the year. So uh, after several months of trying out different spots, I found that this spot circled right here, uh, where I have these concrete blocks set up for my tripod, that was the best spot for me in terms of the sky for what I like to photograph. I then had the good fortune of having this connection. And the connection was with a local professional architect named Timothy Emerson, who is also an amateur astronomer, astrophotographer. And he offered to come up and consult with me. So of course I said, yes, we filmed the conversation and I put it on my YouTube channel. He grew up in New Hampshire and now works in Western Massachusetts. And that's important because, you know, someone who knows the area knows the environmental conditions and can tell you a lot about like all kinds of things that I wasn't thinking about, like the type of soil and how, you know, frost line and all these different things that are really important in building a building like this. And then right um, before this conversation was scheduled to happen, we had really record-breaking rainfall in my area. It wasn't this bad right in my house. My basement did flood and get up to about two feet of standing water. But many towns near me in Vermont, you know, it, it looked like that. Like it was really bad flooding. I don't know if you remember that last July. Um, and so I went into this conversation with Timothy knowing that I wanted to talk, you know, a lot about, okay, if I'm gonna build this observatory, how do I protect it from flood damage? And so that was really helpful too because he had a bunch of cool ideas for that. Um, one of them was to build it on an area of the property that had a gentle slope so that the water uh, from flooding would sort of drain down to, you know, tributaries and streams naturally, it wouldn't pool. Another thing he suggested was b putting the building up pretty high off the ground. I was already planning to use these concrete piers for the foundation. Um, but then he also told me about like, how to prepare the area underneath the building with a moisture barrier and this thick layer of crushed stone to help with other moisture related problems and then also how to make sure that was draining correctly. And so um, I think this is a good segue into the, the next topic that I wanna cover. So this was all site selection. The next topic I wanna cover is observatory design. And it wasn't until I really got invested in doing this that I realized just how many design decisions are involved beyond just the obvious. Like the obvious to me with observatory design is are you what kind of roof you're doing? Are you doing a dome? Are you doing a roll off roof? But it, it wasn't until I like started researching this that I realized like, oh, wow, there's so many options for how to do the foundation and the floor. Um, and for a building like this, the way I did it, ended up being very particular to my location and about my concerns with flooding and all these kinds of different things. Um, but also how long I wanted the building to last. Like you can imagine some people put in an observatory and they just put it on some concrete pavers and call it a day and maybe it won't last forever, but it's cheap and it works. Um, I wanted the building to last a long time. So I, I wanted to make sure that whatever I was doing with the foundation was, was solid. Another very common way to do the observatory floor, so you can see the way I'm doing it is I have these foundational concrete piers. Those go below the frost line into the ground. And then my wood floor is sitting on those uh, concrete piers. There's these metal connectors in between them. Um, another way to do it is you can pour a thick concrete slab. And if you are in a place where the ground never freezes, you can just do what's called a floating slab. So you basically just pour a thick concrete slab right on the ground and call it a day. Um, if I wanted to do a concrete slab in New Hampshire, I would have to do, uh, I, can't, I think he called it a haunch slab or a T slab where it's like, it basically has a full wall foundation around the entire perimeter going down below the frost line um, plus the slab. Uh, all is like one big pour. And 
to me, that sounded, you know, not doable for me alone and also probably too expensive for me anyways. So this leads me into how I made uh, decisions when it came to design with this project. Because, and I, I realized after I was making the YouTube videos that I never really addressed this um, in the videos directly, but I saw in the comments, people would be always asking me questions about like, why did you do it that way? Why didn't you do it this other way that I think is better? Or, you know, why didn't you spend all this money on this kind of material? And it all sort of comes down to the way I was making decisions with design. So the first thing was any design decision for me had to support the main goals that I had with the observatory. And so here are my top five goals. Um, I wanted to do two isolated peers, uh, telescope peers. So if you wanna do two telescope peers in one observatory, it makes sense to do a roll off roof design, right? Because if if you if you don't do a roll off roof, then you're doing two domes. And it, that, I just think that gets a little bit overly finicky. Um, so I think if you're doing two or more telescope peers, roll off roof makes sense. So I had that decision made. The second decision I had to make was, is this something that I just want to sort of throw out there as quickly as possible just to get something going? Um, or do I want to build it to last? I was pretty confident that I like this house. And so I want to have it built to last. For me, that means like 15, 20 years at least. Um, and then three, I wanted the observatory to be comfortable for me. And I'm six foot one. So I wanted like a full size door. I didn't want to have to be ducking for the, you know, when the roof was closed, all these kinds of things play into uh, the design you're going to do. And another thing I will say about the tree line is a lot of people say, well, you know, why build it with such a tall tree line? It is sort of nice that where you, the tree line is your limit, right? So you can then build the walls as tall as you want. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a nice little uh, perk. Uh, I don't have to worry ever about ducking in my observatory. And I also don't have to worry about how big a telescope I can put in and still close the roof. Um, so I made my telescope piers uh, short enough that even if I put in a 12 inch Newtonian or a seven inch refractor, um, I could still close the roof with those telescopes in the park position. Um, so that's another thing I sort of considered with wall height and things like that. And then five, my I wanted to go fully automated, not right now, but later. So I was thinking about with every decision, does the support eventually adding a motor and all kinds of other uh, things that you would need to fully automate the building. So once the design decision meets all of those criteria, then my next thing that I thought was, okay, that's fine, but can I actually do it myself? Because I've decided I'm gonna build this completely myself. Is it physically possible to do it? And do I need a lot of expertise? Because a lot of times people's comments were like, well, why didn't you build the whole um, extension beams out of metal? And it's sort of like, uh, just because I don't know how to do that and I don't think I'm gonna learn how to do that in time to, to finish them on time, you know? So I understand wood, I don't understand metal. That's the that's the reason basically. Um, and then going into that is also a lot of decisions I made based on money, right? Because building a two peer roll off roof observatory does cost a fair amount. It's probably the most I've spent on the hobby on one thing, if you consider it one thing. Um, and so you do have to think about this. I, I didn't go in with a set budget of like, I'm only gonna spend this much, but I sort of knew all along the way, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm making decisions also based on how much something costs. And it, that goes into not just materials, but also tools. And so when I was looking at tools like a concrete mixer or all these kinds of different things that I had to buy, I was thinking, if I'm only really planning to use this once or twice, I'm going to get it at Harbor Freight. If it's something that I'm planning to use a lot, like a, a drill or a, a, a nailer, then I maybe will spend a little bit more on it. OK, I'm not going to read through all of this slide, but I just wanted to put it into my presentation because it's another thing that 
I ne I sort of regret never um, sharing in my YouTube series, uh, but I used a lot of resources, especially in the research phase leading up to building it. Um, but uh, some of these I, I would refer back to while building it as well. W one thing that I find really interesting is, you know, if you're building a observatory in this style, it's basically a shed. And so a lot of the best resources I found were the YouTube channels about shed building f made by carpenters because they really um, could get into the nitty gritty in ways that I'd found the Astro channels didn't. Uh, so I really loved those first two. I went back to those a lot. Uh, Country Life Projects had a series on shed building and King's Fine Woodworking also had a series on shed building. And oh, tons of their advice you could carry right over into building the observatory. Um, and it, it filled in a lot of the details that I needed based on looking at plans and looking at books. Because uh, looking at plans and books was good for just sort of getting like, the broad picture, but they didn't go into the nitty gritty of like, well, how do you actually build it? Um, so that's where the YouTube channels uh, were really useful. And then uh, I, I'll just mention that Telescope Peers ebook, which is on telescopepeers.com. I found that a really nice read if you just want to read about all the different types of telescope peers you can do and the, the advantages, disadvantages of different types of material. Because you can, of course, um, attach a, a steel pier to a concrete slab or concrete uh, footer underground. I did a concrete pier. So there's there's both concrete going down into the ground and concrete above ground. Now, uh, I'm sharing all these resources, but one thing that I'll say is that with my personality, I can just never stop researching. It, it, it's a sort of a, I'm a librarian by training. So I love research and I, I can go really overboard. Um, and so one thing that I found was happening was uh, what I like to call analysis paralysis. I didn't come up with that. Someone else did, but I think it's a good term for what happened to me where there was tons of information. It, my problem was not at all a lack of information about building sheds, building observatories. Um, there was, but what can happen is you have so much information to work through and try to sort out and find out what's relevant to you that you can start just being like, well, I guess I can't start building yet because I haven't made every decision that I have to make, right? Um, I was really literally thinking, I have to think through every decision that I'm going to make for the entire observatory build before I start. But the truth is you can't do that, <laughs> especially if you're building it on your own with no experience. Um, you, you really need to actually just get started because you're going to learn so much more as you go that you, you really just want to get started on these kinds of projects because um, once you actually start, you'll realize what kind of questions you can ask Google, what kind of questions you can uh, mine out of YouTube or out of books. Um, and this is especially true if you live in a climate like mine, where it's very inconvenient to work once we have snow cover. Uh, just imagine, you know, it's like you drop a nail or a screw on the ground. It's gone. You don't, you'll never see it again until the snow melts. Um, so... I didn't end up, I, I, I'll say I wanted to start working in June of 2023, and I didn't start work really until the last week of August. So I, I started two months late. And the reason that matters is because even with this late start, this was my very optimistic planned timeline. I thought that I could start and be functionally done, you know, with the roof on in basically two months. Uh, that did not happen. <laughs> Everything took about twice as long as I thought it would. Um, so this was the actual timeline here. And there, there were some breaks in there. I had to do some travel, but it's, it's still basically true that things took twice as long. And so the timing really only matters, though, if you live in an environment where, where the timing matters, right? So I, since I live in New Hampshire, 
I knew that it was going to be much harder to work on this or impossible for me to work on this if the ground was frozen, covered in snow. I was getting dumped on with snow all the time. Um, but I got very lucky in that we had a very strange year and didn't get a major snowstorm at my place until January 7th. So I was able to work really hard in the home stretch and actually finish the roof on January 6th, uh, the night before the uh, snowstorm came in. And so, or actually the night uh, that the snowstorm did come in, I was literally installing the ridge cap, the, the metal cap on top of the metal roof when the snowstorm started. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to say about timing is don't let, you know, analysis paralysis stop you from getting started on a, a reasonable date or, or the date that you planned. I'll stop here and just see if there's any questions. Yeah, yeah, that's a good time. I was going to stop you pretty quick here. Um, uh, specifically, let's talk about the frost line. Um, I was going to ask this question a while back. How far down does the frost uh, line have to, um, how far down is the frost line? Yes. So it depends on its, it depends on your latitude. And, um, you know, the further north you are, the, the further down you're going to have to dig. In southern New Hampshire, where I'm at, it's four feet. 48 inches. I talked to a number of people who are building in Canada where it's six feet. Um, in the mid latitudes, you know, uh, Delaware, I think it's three feet. Um, and then of course in the, in the South, it might be like six inches or, or non-existent. It might, the ground basically will never freeze. And then you don't have to worry about it. And if you don't have to worry about it, what that means is you probably still will dig your telescope here down a ways. Um, but for the building itself, you don't have to worry about that shifting as much. Uh, tell us, uh, Isaac wants to know, a couple of things Isaac wants to know. Why is it important to go before, below the frost line? Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, so when the ground freezes, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of moisture in the ground, right? And so when the ground freezes and then thaws and it has this freeze thaw cycle, the whole thing shifts. And so if you imagine a roll off roof, if your building shifts, the roll off roof twists and then you no longer can push it off. Um, so that, that's the main reason. And, uh, you know, a, a, another reason is you don't want your telescope here constantly shifting because then it sort of undoes one of the great advantages of a observatory, which is you don't have to pull your line as often. Uh, if, it, if your telescope here is constantly shifting around, then uh, it sort of undoes that. So by digging and pouring the concrete below the frost line, you basically have this stable thing that isn't shifting like that because okay. the the bottom is is below the frost line, so that's it. It doesn't uh, move as much. So um, I'm a Southern California boy, so I don't have frost lines. I don't do I don't yeah. do frost lines. You know. Uh, anyway, from what I understand, is basically the soil becomes spongy, and yes. so if there's a weight imbalance, something can shift, and then it'll freeze again the next year in a different position and then it'll thaw the next summer and be free to shift again yep so exactly. something like that hey um isaac also wants to know if you could tell us what would the total cost of all this going to be if you if you don't mind talking about that sure um i think i totaled it at um twelve thousand for just you know if you if i didn't include tools now i spent a lot of money on tools since there were a lot of tools i didn't have so i think that put me over fifteen thousand. um but that that gives you sort of an idea if you if you do all the labor yourself now if you don't if you if i weren't to do all the labor myself on this that would probably double the cost right because labor is expensive um I work with an operation. Our club has a number of these uh, facilities that look quite a bit like yours. And um, um, a contractor right now would cost about 20,000 bucks to put one of these into the Southern California desert. Great. Okay. And when you say you have to get below the frost line, that 48 inches, 
the holes have to be 48 inches plus or just if you get down to 48 you are below the frost line you want to be you want it to be below the frost line so the frost line where i'm at is actually um not quite 48 inches 40 inches is what, is what i dug i believe i looked it up and there's these these maps that the um okay usgs produces or something and it was 44 inches so i went a little bit below i think if you go four to six inches below you're good okay and Raphael wants to know if you've got some plans upgrading from the old EQ6 when all this is done. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about them yet in case I want to like make it a you know a surprise kind of video. But I, I do have a plan to upgrade from the EQ6 as an observatory uh, class mount. Although I will say the the EQ6 are on the concrete pier. It's like a different mount. Uh, it's 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 just so steady now like I, I used to some nights you know get a little bit more of a rocky graph and now it's just like it's i rarely ever get that anything above like 0.7 rms is is rare now okay thank you that's all the questions that we've got out there right now okay. just don't forget everybody you can type into the chat there on the side and we'll get the questions to nico for you when we get another break Sounds uh, good. Nico, I have a question oh, sure. before, before you go back. Did you dig all those post holes yourself with the post hole digger? Yes, I did. Uh, I'll go how back to it. 48 how many inches. Calluses? What's that? How many calluses do you have on your hand? Oh, yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. But how do you get a pull apart uh, post hole digger down 48 inches? You must have uh, been on your the knees. The one and I, I bought, I think, was five feet tall um and i and i'm six feet so it it sort of works <laughs> but yeah Ed, when you're when you're down towards the bottom of the hole it's it's pretty challenging because you're you know you're down on your knees trying to just get this little last bit of dirt up uh yeah it, it was challenging dude so next time you know that harm depot down the road they <laughs> they could fix that problem for you yeah so, I, I mean again it, a lot of it was sort of a cost thing i did i did look at what uh you know it would cost to um post hole digger no to well to rent sort of a motorized thing well and then a lot of people are telling me you know just use one of these uh motorized augers and that just does not work for my soil really? type. there's so many stones that um you need to prime out uh one by one basically um, so did, you, did you ever think well maybe 42 inches would be enough <laughs> yeah I, I was thinking that i, I did look at no. some of you know the other uh I, I had this diagram of the other pipes and things and my well for the property and none of it was 48 inches down so i was like well if none of this is 48 inches down why am i digging 40 inches down but whatever i did it <laughs> don't take shortcuts yeah uh, tell, tell us about the permitting I did not have to do any permitting. Uh, this is New Hampshire, and <laughs> there's not a lot of permits you have to get in this state um, or or this or my township. Um, I did look into it just to make sure, but for a shed like this, uh, it wasn't required. Usually, if it's on 120 square feet, most jurisdictions don't care much about it unless you start putting electrical in. Right. Yeah, I've I've built several of these things, so. I I don't mean to butt in, but no, uh, no, no problem. I like it. Yeah. Okay. And we're done, right? We're back done. to Nico. All right. Okay. So uh if you well, actually, let me back up to here. So remember, <laughs> I'm not good at estimating my own time. I have never been good at this. <laughs> so I should have known that this was going to be a problem with this project, but I'm I'm always slower than I think I'll be uh so th this became a problem though because come october i was like oh i'm behind i i don't want to be slowed down so i asked my lumber yard to uh deliver all the wood for the project all at once and my thinking was you know when i call them up and tell them i want the wood delivered it takes a few days for it to get here and i don't want to be slowed down by not having the wood or panels or whatever it is I need immediately. Um, but this was definitely not a good plan in retrospect because I wasn't really even thinking through how much material was going to be delivered. So I didn't have 
room for all of this like in a dry space you know I, I couldn't put all of this material in my garage it wouldn't fit um so what i ended up having to do was you know put this material on um wood you know on on uh, just spare wood pieces on the yard and then tarp it whenever it was going to rain and the problem with that is you know long pieces of lumber just sitting out there stacked up like this they start to warp the the um, moisture in the ground starts to create mold and all kinds of things and what i thought was going to take me you know a couple weeks uh to finish you know goes on for months and so a lot of the materials that i got i and spent a lot of money on you know i think would have been better in better condition if i kept them at the lumber yard until i needed them and the, and the lumber yard is was fine about delivering in multiple deliveries but it was me that decided to bring it all at once so that was not a good decision um there were some things that I was able to make and store in my dry garage. Um, I made the roof trusses ahead of time and was able to store them. The metal roofing sort of was fairly easy to store vertical, so I could put that inside too. Um, but uh, some of the bigger pieces, I, I don't know. I think they might have warped because of my neglect. Uh, so I would I would have redone that in 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 retrospect. So the, the next uh, series of slides, I, I want to talk about building on your own. I was pretty worried about this, actually, uh, going into the project. I wasn't sure if it was going to work out uh, because, again, I didn't have much building experience. But I found that this wasn't really a burden at all for me. I, I was, you know, thinking, am I going to be able to lift up the materials? Am I, am I going to... Uh, have an accident or something nothing bad happened and so i mean knock on wood i don't know if i just got lucky but i do have some tips if you're interested in building an observatory on your own um, things that you should be prepared for um, and this photo i found uh, shows a lot of the hacks that i've found for for building alone but i'll break them down sort of one by one uh the the first one is Oh, that third step ladder got cut off. You can never have enough step ladders. Uh, you could. I have three set up in this picture, and uh, I'm was constantly setting up many step ladders, going back and forth between them, and it's it's pretty annoying if you only have one step ladder to be constantly moving it around. So the more step ladders you have, uh, the better for this kind of thing, especially once you get to the walls, the roof, all that kind of stuff. Another thing that became essential was this scaffolding, uh, which is basically just a big metal uh, platform. You'll see it on construction sites. Um, you'll see much bigger scaffolding, of course. This is a fairly small one. Um, but I didn't have to buy this, actually, because my neighbor uh, in New Hampshire, uh, right across the trees there, uh, he had built his entire house. And so when he saw I was doing this, he said, oh, well, I have all this scaffolding, all these different things because I built my whole house over there. And so I'll just loan it to you. So that was great because I didn't have to buy it or rent it. I could just uh, borrow it from him. And the thing with the that's very helpful with the scaffolding was when I was making this extension because that beam right there is a double two by 10 uh, that's almost, or no, it is 20 feet long, I think. And so if you put, if I put, had put that double two by 10 together on the ground and tried to lift it up there, it would have been impossible. I couldn't have done it. So what I did was I built it on the scaffolding and then I only had to lift it up about a foot rather than up 10 feet. Uh, so th that was really helpful for building things up near where they had to go. Another uh, thing that is essential uh, when you're doing this is to use all kinds of scrap wood to brace pieces or to set up blocks for uh, putting pieces where they need to go. And so what, the idea with this is you just, they're just um, temporarily holding things up uh, with scrap wood. So you just screw them in with a few long screws and it, it works really well. Um, a lot of times, you know, with bracing like that, holding up the posts, it's, 
it's holding them up securely. They're not going to fall down, but you can still adjust the level and squareness of the of the post, um, just like it's a person standing there holding it for you. And so I found that bracing like that uh, was really helpful. Another thing that's that's like having extra hands are these uh, one-handed bar clamps. Uh, these, whenever you're doing, especially for all the finish work, all the putting on the panels, putting on the trim, all that kind of stuff, these things were essential. Uh, you you just um, can close the clamp with that, with that uh, grip right there, uh, just with one hand. Okay, so that's it uh, for building on your own section. Uh, the next section is, and this might be the last section already, is sort of just a collection of lessons that I learned, uh, both minor and major. I, I, I know I've been sort of sharing them throughout, but I just had a bunch more that I uh, was thinking of towards the end here. So the first one is that uh, one of my major mistakes, even though I'm saying this is a minor lesson learned, is that the first time I poured the foundational piers for the building, they weren't level with one another. And what happened here was I was using a laser to try to understand the level between the piers. Um, but that's a, just apparently not a good way to go about it. Um, so when I posted this video, there were tons of comments telling me the correct way to do it was you get a rigid, clear PVC tube, you fill that with half fill that with water, and that and then you you stretch that between the two piers, and that's a much more reliable way to tell you <laughs> if they're if they're level across. Um, the way I ended up doing it was I just got one of those uh, six foot long i-beam levels and i put boards between them and i i used that and that that worked a lot better than the laser too i think the problem with the laser was that it wasn't uh even if you get a self-leveling laser i think that it, it just doesn't uh work uh, as as i'd hoped okay uh another lesson that i learned uh the hard way was and you maybe you can sort of see what i'm doing from the picture here when when it got to the roof, it got quite annoying with the step ladders because all of the ground around my observatory had uh, holes, had parts that weren't even, had uh, rocks. And by the time I was putting on the roof, the ground had frozen uh, solid. <laughs> so it was it was very hard to level the ground at this point. So what I'd wish I had done was I'd spent time leveling the ground around the observatory for ladders before the ground froze <laughs> because it was just i can't tell you how many times i got up on the ladder and it was just shaking around on me like i was going to fall over and then i had to get back down and, and readjust it uh, to get the four uh, legs of the ladder on solid ground okay and then uh you can see here, this is in the middle of the step where I'm you know, putting on the, the panels on the front of the building here. And if you look into the back, I haven't done it on the back yet. And so the lesson learned here is start in the back because, and this didn't occur to me until I finished the entire project. I was always starting things in the front and that's where I was learning how to do it, right? So I was making all kinds of little mistakes um, and then by the time I got to the back of the building, I had learned from my mistakes and the back went very smoothly. But it would have made a lot more sense to start in the back with every step and go to the front because the front side is what people actually see and what I actually see every time I approach the observatory. So that now, now the way that it is, every time I approach the observatory, every little mistake that I made stands out to me. But if they were all in the back, it wouldn't be as big of a concern. Um, to me, I'm still listing this as a minor lesson learned because I'm not super particular about the observatory looking perfect, but it's just funny to me that this never occurred to me the whole time of working on the uh, observatory that I should do every step from the back to the front. Okay, and then uh, 
these are my uh, custom drawn plans. I, I did, you know, as I mentioned with the resources, uh, I did buy plans, but none of them quite worked the way I wanted to make the observatory. So I had to alter them. Um, and in altering them, I ended up with a 10 by 14 foot building. Um, but in retrospect, I, I sort of wish that I thought about this more and gone with slightly different measurements because with the measurements I used, I ended up with uh, a fair amount of waste. Like and it, by waste, I mean, it's like, you know, you take a, a two by 10, a two by eight or whatever, and you're cutting off one and a half feet or two feet. And then there's nothing you can really do with that remnant. It's just waste material. So I, I, I just have thought, I wonder if there was measurements I could have used with a, you know, and ended up with a building size I liked pretty much as well as the one I have, but could have reduced waste on materials. And I, I the re reason I'm thinking about this is because if you look at some of the, uh, the plans from backyard observatories and uh, some of the others, they'll they'll use these odd measurements and they'll mention the reason we're doing this is to reduce waste uh, so so i think it's a good idea okay and then major lessons learned um and th this one i already went over but i just want to reiterate it because i think it's important you'll learn a lot if you've never done this before you're going to learn so much faster once you actually start the building process so once you have your site, your goals, your resources lined up, just start building. Uh, don't be like me and wait another three months putting you way behind just because you didn't feel like you had everything uh, all figured out yet because you're gonna figure things out as you go anyways. So it's better just to start and, and start on time. And then my last uh, lesson learned is that for me, uh, one of the really fun parts about astrophotography is the problem solving aspect of it. And so building an observatory is full of problems. And if you're a problem solver kind of personality, that's really fun. That's the fun part of it. So uh, enjoy the journey if you do build your own observatory. And, and I think it's, it's a whole lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. We've had a few more questions come in. Let me look at a Purvas, uh, a Purvas. Um, how, how did you plan where you were going to put the major peers, the two peers, so that they wouldn't conflict with each other, they wouldn't bump into each other and all that other stuff? Um, yeah, good question. So I knew that I wanted to put um, a full-size door uh, in between the two piers. So I knew that I had to put the door on the long side of the building. A lot of people have asked me why I didn't put the door on the short side. And that's the reason is because I wanted to be able to come in and out of the building knowing I could fully open that door and it wouldn't be a problem. Um, and then other than that, I basically just uh, centered the piers on the, on the short side and then made them equally spaced, if you know what I mean, on the long side to give as much room around each one as possible. Now, in thinking of the overall measurements, you do want to think about your longest telescope and make sure that there's enough space uh, from all walls and between the two piers that you're not going to have any collisions. I, I made mine oversized so that like I can even, with my longest telescopes, walk between the two piers uh, while they're going. Uh, so it's it's up to you. You could you for imaging, you could make that a lot tighter. But I'm doing a lot of. And was it a Purva? Wants to know connections to wherever it's going. Is it going back to the house? Do you have a warm room in the building? Um, are you ever going to be there when it's at work? I don't have a warm room uh, and I don't plan to make one. Uh, I'm sort of a creature of the cold, so I, I don't mind being out there in the unheated observatory, even in the winter, um, if I'm doing testing. But when I'm just using the building, um, for astrophotography, if I'm not testing anything, I'm 
I'm planning to just use it from the house. So the my house would be the warm room and it'll be connected. Uh, I have thought about running internet, you know, an ethernet cable, but I don't think I will because uh, I've just done a lot of testing now and the Wi-Fi signal is super strong out there. Uh, so I think I'm gonna be fine with just uh, Wi-Fi. Um, and then electricity, I haven't run yet, but I do plan to run electricity to it. Right now, I'm just uh, running an extension cable. And again, Home Depot does have a trencher that can get that wire out there a lot more easily. <laughs> um, believe me, I've done this. Uh, uh, you rent them, by the way, you don't have to buy them. Um, John asked, how do you seal the gap between the roof and the uh, building? But I want to expand that to just what does your rolling mechanism look like? Sure. So uh, my, my rolling mechanism is a uh, garage door track with uh, lots of uh, wheels. Um, you know, the wheels are basically just spaced so that there's just an, a one inch gap between the wheels. Um, so it, it's a very, it's a fairly heavy roof, but when you're distributing the weight across that many garage door wheels, it works. Um, and the reason I liked the garage door track was I saw my friends, Jay Sotolanos, and he was just telling me about it. I liked how it was captured and all these different things. And then you can protect the garage door track a little bit more easily than the exposed um, inverted V, I guess, um, for, for ice and things like that. I mean, but I guess the more that I'm learning about it, I'm not sure if it matters because if you really want to protect either from ice and, and things like that, you're probably going to have to either cover them or heat them, right, for the exposed part. Um, so I haven't done that yet either, um, but if anyone has uh, ideas here or in the chat about what they think works best, because there's sort of two options. You can either come up with some kind of cover for the exposed part or you can heat the exposed part uh, with like um, what they use for under roofs for ice dams. Okay. So when you want to open your roof now, it's just strictly crank it manually or get up yeah. on a ladder. Exactly. It's it's just manual. Yeah. So Do you have to crank it or can you push it? I can push it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So is there any position your telescope could be in where it might impact the roof? No. In an emergency? No. Does that mean? Well, you earlier said that it was below the roof line when it was parked. And I think Eric is asking when it's pointing at the straight up, is it going to, could the roof close? The, when, a, when a telescope is parked, that, that is as high as it can be. Even if you, even if you go oh. straight up, it, it, it's going to be slightly lower, actually. So oh, park okay. position is the highest it can be, I think. Oh, so you have a different park position too. Yeah, you have a different yeah, sure. park. Yeah, okay. NAT Park Four position. You're using a straight up park position. Yeah, straight up park position. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, let me see where are we go. And uh, you didn't answer about sealing the gap between the. Oh sure. Um, so I'm still working on that as well. Um, you know, for the part that for where the roof moves over the wall, you basically have to use something that's going to, uh, I don't know how to describe this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying bristle brushes right now for that part where it's just like you have two layers of bristle. And the, the main point of that is not to keep out moisture, but to keep out insects, I think. Um, and then for the other parts, you can use like vinyl flaps and things like that. All of this I'm still sort of experimenting with, but usually use some kind of flexible vinyl, things like that. We that was have what not, our uh, speaker we, last week used was the plastic vinyl and then also brushes and it kept okay. everything out. Great. <laughs> we, we have not yet found a suitable answer to that question. Um, basically, it, you just can't seal it completely. No, um, I don't think it, I don't think the goal is to seal it yeah. completely. And I, you know, I live in a climate where I'm not doing any kind of heating or AC or anything. So yeah. I'm not trying to climate control it in yeah. that way. I, sealing it is just more about insects and mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff. And so, as far as the garage door arrangement versus the uh, inverted V with the wheels, we have found that um, those inverted V with the wheels are much nicer 
for our purposes, that may be different in, in yours. Our, we're out in the California desert, but it, it actually works better, cleaner, everything works. But that doesn't mean that the old one, my, I have the garage door rollers, but we've been building them for 15, 20 years out there. And most of our new installations are going with the uh, roller on the wedge. So what's uh, your critter population out there? Oh, we have everything, uh, coyotes, bears, everything uh, you can imagine. But they, they seem to sort of <laughs> stick to themselves as long as you don't, you know, provoke them. I mean, I'm, what about rodents, you know, like mice and rats? Yeah, we have all of that too. So yeah, that, that's another thing I've been thinking about is how to do the electrical with conduits that maybe the rodents don't want to chew through and things like that. We are clear of uh, questions out of the chat group. Anybody in the room? No, I think we're all good. Okay. Are we all good, guys? Yeah, sounds good to me. Good. Uh, well, thanks very much, Nico. A great presentation. You know, we we all had angst while you were working on that and <laughs> standing on the ladder, lifting those beams. And and I was just thinking about last week where we had um, an explanation of how to build a remote observatory uh, that would hold 20 scopes at a time. And uh, just how the scale of what we were talking about is so much different. I like the way you did yeah. this. I like the way they did it last week, obviously, but uh, this do it yourself stuff was cool. So you got dressed up for the picture for the final. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I thought I was I was wearing such ratty clothes for the whole series. I was like, I want to finish this off with something nice. A nice suit and tie. Yeah, that's great. Great picture. Well, thanks again. Uh, great presentation. You had an audience. Actually, you have an audience right to the end. Great. About 90 some people. I'm sure you'll have a lot more coming during the next couple of weeks. So if that's it, if we can say good night to everyone. Good night, everyone. Uh, who's who's running the show tonight? Molly? On it. Yeah. Molly, you can take us out. All right. Hopefully, we'll see everyone next week. And in two weeks, it's the eclipse. It's the eclipse. I'm so yeah, excited. <laughs> what eclipse. Uh, may the odds oh. be ever in your favor. Oh, yeah. Cross, <laughs> cross all your fingers and all your toes, toes. for the weather. <laughs> if you can cross your toes. Yeah. Uh, Nico, you can uh, hang around for us if sure. you'd like. Come right. back for Adam next week, I think. Yes. Yeah, Adam Block next week. All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.